Telecom to Matthias Herbert. Thank you. So, um, as Sophia said, I'm, I'm the co-founder and CTO of a company that's called Citizen Data. And today on my talk, I'm going to tell you the journey we had from Thread to API. And when I mean Thread, I mean Thread. That's not the kind of Thread you're used to. Uh, our company was uh, spun off from a consortium that's called Smart Sensing that does intelligent fabric. It's a consortium with various members. Uh, Eolan is a microelectronics company. Payan is a fabric company. They're actually weaving fabric. Cyclilab is selling some cycle equipments. Telecom Bretagne is an academic doing some research. And then we have um, a set of partners which are in the sporting business. We have a rugby team. Sports, uh, Stade Toulousain. We have a football team and we have two basketball teams, including the Tony Parker's uh, training center. And that consortium is, is led by a company that's called Citizen Sciences, which, of which we're a spinoff. So that consortium does intelligent fabric. What do we mean by intelligent fabric? It's fabric within which are woven both an electronic bus and sensors. So you have rolls of fabric, and inside those square meters of fabric, you have a tiny bus and sensors embedded in, in, in the fabric. So you can't see them, but they're actually measuring things. So the idea behind, the first idea behind those intelligent fabric is the world of sports. So uh, smart sensing aims at building products like running jersey or cycling shorts within which will be woven sensors and which will actually measure lots of things like heart rate, temperature, hydration of the skin, and then displacement, acceleration, and, and other things like, like that. So the first idea and first use case is individual sports, and the second use case is the the professional sports and, and the team coaching, helping the coaches actually coach the, the teams they're following by accessing the data from all the players in the team while they're practicing or while they're playing during the league, the league, the championships, and, and, and various games. So that led us to uh, one, spin out uh, citizen data, and then build a platform for all that data. So the first decision we had to make was are we going to keep that inside the smart sensing consortium and actually get the company out and let it roll on its own? And that's the second way we actually chose. So we spun out the company and decided that we were going to build a platform um, which will be separate from the app, from the application, both for the individual sport enthusiast and for the team coaches. So that was the first decision we made. That, lend, that led us to having a to-do list for that application, for that platform, which contained mainly three things. The first one was, how are we going to collect the data? Second one was, how are we going to store the data? And third one is, how are we going to retrieve the data? So, collecting data. What kind of data are we talking about? We have sensors embedded in the fabric, so in the clothes, and we have microelectronic devices in the back of the clothes also collecting some information from sensors, from other sensors. So first thing we have is a whole bunch of sensor readings. And sensor readings are what we call time series. There are sequences of readings from various sensors spread along the time during the time you're practicing or, or actually doing a match. So decision number one was how are we going to build an abstraction for that kind of data. And we, and we built, uh, we, we invented a generic format for representing time series, which looks a little bit like that. So we have a class which defines what kind of data we're talking about. We have labels. Basically, you're going to identify the, the runner. You're going to identify the, the clothes. You're going to identify the gateway that's in the back. And then you have values associated with timestamps. Now, we thought, OK, those are for generic readings from sensors, but 
what kind of data are we really collecting on those, on those clothes, on, on those intelligent garments? They're actually both physiological and actimetric data. So physiological is your heart rate and actimetric is how you move. So that means that all the sensors we have are actually moving. So we decided to not only consider the time but consider space as well. So on our platform, we handle what we call geotime series and each measurement, each reading from a sensor has both a timestamp and a location. And that changes everything because you, you can actually enable application that you could not enable if you're just tracking location separately from the rest of your sensors. Okay, so next question we had to ask was, how are we gonna get the data? And when you look at the sensor world, there are lots of, lots of technologies that are pushed by the electronic makers, the, the, the sensor companies actually producing the electronic chip which has the embedded sensor. Um, it turns out that those protocols are very, are very lightweight because they're usually meant for low energy devices with very restricted bandwidths. So instead we chose to go with HTTP as the first uh, step and then to de we decided not to close the door to the other protocol. So you might hear things like CoAP, Constraint Application Protocol or MQTT. Lots of those protocols will probably be supported in the future but for now since we were controlling the electronic devices that was collecting the, the, the data from the T-shirt, we went with HTTP. And that was a wise decision because that enables to go faster than supporting the other ones. Next question we ask is how much data and how fast are we going to collect it? Well, it turns out it's lots of data. And it also turns out it's very fast we're collecting those data. Why lots of data? Because We've been experimenting with socks that actually measure the pressure under your foot and they measure the pressure 400 times per second. So that's lots of data. So first thing we decided, next thing we decided to do was to support batch uploads so we could actually push millions of measurements in one batch and not make thousands of calls through the API to actually push that data onto the platform. And then we started hitting some limitation of, of, of some um, components in, 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 the, in the chain is that reverse proxies tend to be willing to actually materialize the request in their memory before pushing it to the origin server. If you're pushing 10 million points, that doesn't work because you're going to eat up all the memory. So, so you have to be clever in, in the components you actually choose. Um, as for how fast we're actually pushing the data, I said that was very fast. So if you're pushing a, a million time series, a million different time series because you've been focusing all the data collected from many teams or many sensors in, in the environment onto one API call, you don't want to do a million lookups. So we adopted a principle that we tend to stick to all the time, which is a no lookup principle. So if you can intelligently use hashes and ciphers and encrypt data in the tokens you use, for example, you don't want to do a lookup in a database because doing that a million times per second is really not something you want to deal with. Okay, next thing was the data we collect. Um, we're not collecting comments on blogs or stuff like that. We're collecting data from machines. And guess what about machines? They're not always on. Sometimes they fail, sometimes they lose uh, connectivity which means that if you consider that time series is a sequence of measurements that you will get in order, well, you're wrong. You will not get them in order. They will come out out of order. They will come out very, very late. Sometimes we have machines actually come back up after two or, two or three days, and then you get the, the, the data from two or three days before. And sometimes you get duplicate data. So, Next decision is make data collection idempotent so you can you know, ingest several times the same data point. It's no big deal. You're not going to end up with several copies of it. Okay, now on to storing the data. So how much data did we say we were storing? That was lots of data. If you have a sensor that measures something once every minute, that's 500,000 measurements per year. If it's one every second, that's 30 millions per year. If you have thousands of those sensors, which is rather 
a small number of sensors. If you take a building, for example, you have thousands of sensors in a building. One sensor, um, every second, every year, is 30 million. So if you have a thousand of those, it's 30 billion data points. So you need a scalable backend. You can't just store that in flat files or, or in, in a standard database. That's not going to work, especially if you want to plug your API and actually retrieve that data in a timely manner afterwards. OK, so on the first use case, it's data from T-shirts. So it's heart rates. It's highly personal data. You don't want your heart rate to be in the wild like that. So you have to think about encryption. You want to be able to have your hard drive stolen and, and people stealing, stealing the hard drive not be able to access the data you have on those hard drives. So you start to think about encrypting the data on the back end. But then that's one piece of advice that's written on the bottom. If someone tells you and it says ens encryption to you, you reply with key management. Because if they actually put the key to access or to encrypt the data into their application, then you don't bother with encrypting their data. It's useless. Okay, so retrieving the data now. So how much data do we have? Lots and lots of data. I've said that several times. So when you retrieve the data, because you store that data for a building, for example, and then someone tells you, I'd like to retrieve a year worth of all the sensors in that building. So you have to retrieve 30 billion points. How do you do that? Well, the first thing you do is you ban buffering. You, do, you just want to do streaming. You don't want to materialize those data into memory, neither in your app nor in the reverse proxy sitting in front of your app. Otherwise, your infrastructure is going to die. So the data we store on the platform is not ours. It, it's the data collected from the t-shirts and from the garments or from the sensors that some people installed in their environment. So it's their data. So next thing we thought and we decided to do was to enable on the platform uh, a sharing API, saying that the same way you can actually bring your tweets from Twitter to an ecosystem of applications, we want to enable you to do that with your heartbeat measurements, with your position, any sensor in your environment. If, you, if there's an app that can provide you value by reading those data and, and, and you can port your data to that app, then good, because everybody wins. So that's something that's embedded in the, in the application, in the application, in the platform, and into the API. And that's based on OAuth 2.0. So next thing we thought about was, what do people actually retrieving the data do with the data? And we realized that when you want to graph data a month worth of data, and you've been collecting that data every minute, you don't need all the data points. So lots of people were actually shrinking the, the, the size of the data or rolling up into you know, 15, 15 minutes or one hour intervals, whatever. So we decided, OK, let's put some of those features back into the API. So people will be able to call the API saying, I want a summary statistics of my data, or I want roll-ups of my data on, on 30 minutes interval, and just want to retrieve the, the result of, the, of those roll-ups. So that's what we, the next thing we built into the API was that. But then we said, OK, well, that's kind of trivial to do. Roll-ups, summary statistics, computing means, variance, standard deviation, who cares? Everybody does that. So we need to provide some more value. Otherwise, our API won't be any different from the next guy's API. So what we did was think about, is it worth keeping adding things onto the API, or is the way we manipulate those geo time series really a data flow model, saying that we're going to start rolling up the data in 30 minutes interval, and then we're going to maybe try to find a threshold and then do another uh, manipulation of the data. So we ended up uh, creating a language that's called Einstein, because we deal with the space-time continuum. That was kind of a joke, an internal joke. But anyway, so we built a language that's called Einstein, and that incorporates um, lots of function and enables you to measure, uh, to uh, do lots of things on the, on the things you've measured earlier. So we included in Einstein very simple data manipulations like computing, means, max, variances, and then some more complex stuff like the one you can see here, 
So that little script here is doing some pattern detection. If you, if you look closely on the, on the graph, you can see that there are some areas of the graph that are red. So th those areas that are red is the occurrences of the WDXT pattern. So don't ask me how we, ex well, we actually uh, extracted that pattern with another function in, in the Einstein library. But anyway, in, in a few lines of code, you can do very complex things that would other, otherwise require that you code for maybe two or three weeks just, just for one thing. And then you can build your application on, to on top of that, of that library. So the Einstein framework, which is the evolution of the API, it offers several frameworks for um, very easily adding functions because most of the time when we, when we see new things to do with the data, they can fall in one of the five frameworks we've designed. Uh, we can talk offline if you wanna know a little bit more about those frameworks. Uh, the other thing we do onto Einstein, instead of adding API calls, we add functions into the language and that all falls under the same API call, which is very, very simple. So we keep adding functions to the, to the language and we try to documenting them on the fly, which is kind of hard because we tend to be more excited by adding code than documentation, but well. So you, you roll out your, your, your functions slowly uh, at the pace of the documentation of them, not, not at the pace you, you code them or you test them. So we have our to-do list, we actually grew a little bit, so we can collect data, store data, retrieve data, share data, and manipulate data in, in, in the platform. And then we said, okay, we built that platform initially for the smart uh, fabric environment. Is it really tied to the smart fabric environment? And the answer is no. And it can be used on many different fields from uh, health, fitness, transportation, environment, energy, smart cities, IT infrastructure supervision, agriculture. Some people actually make um, cows swallow some sensors. So you can track those, so it's very easy. So all those fields and the larger field of connected devices, whatever those devices are. Uh, since it was an API at first, it was built as a SaaS model so it's in the cloud, it's a platform in the cloud that you can access by the, the API and, and the applications can actually consume that API in, in a very traditional way. But we've had customers who said, well, okay, your platform is interesting, your API is interesting, but we want it on our premises. So we looked at the API and said, okay, we can install it on, on premises in, in a customer's uh, data center if need be. So that was the next uh, evolution of the API, actually porting it onto someone else's infrastructure. And then we had other requests for embedding it, so it can also work on a Raspberry Pi. So you won't get so, such high performance on, on a Raspberry Pi, but we can still ingest about around 1,000 metrics per second on a Raspberry Pi, which is pretty good. And then for other customers, since it's really a language that we've built that our, our API actually morphed into a language, we can actually use that language as a language API, as a library API, and, and just embed it in, in about any application that needs to manipulate two time series conformant to the, the model we exposed earlier. That's it, that's what we do. And that's how we actually got from smart fabric to smart API and, and several declination of, of those API. Thank you, for, thank you for this very interesting talk. So I'm sure you have a lot of questions to ask to Matthias. So go ahead, uh, I will give this to you. Anyone has, has the first question? So you talked about uh, converting the fabric to an API and building intelligence to the API, right? Um, so what are you doing to account for a different kind of sensors, the newer body sensors that will be cutting in, and what kind of intelligence are you building, built in the API so it will automatically recognize the sensors? Well, the, there's, there's um, a challenge when you actually embed the sensors into fabric, is that for public health reasons, you want the fabric to actually still be washable. 
So you have a pipeline of sensor validation that's way longer than just taking any sensor and plugging it into the fabric. So the, the sensors that we actually embed in the fabric, they've been qualified for, for several months. You know, we wash them and, um, and put various detergent in, in the washing machine, see if they survive. And most of them actually don't survive. So, so when, you, when you have uh, sensors into the fabric, basically you know that the sensors in the fabric are one of several kinds that you've perfectly identified. So it's not a, you're not just discovering, you know, whatever sensor is, is, is in, embedded in the fabric. They have to be qualified and, and we know exactly which sensors can appear. Not all of them will appear in all uh, fabric uh, square meters, but usually when, when you see that there's a, a sensor, it cannot come out of the blue or otherwise it's, <laughs> it's the probability that it will break after the first wash is pretty high. Does that question? Yeah, just so one uh, simple question. I just wanted to know how to um, you uh, collect the data. Is it over the air, or do you have to plug it well, into something? In, in, in the first version of the, of the T-shirt, there's um, another constraint, is that the, you have to be able to recycle the T-shirt. So you cannot insert a battery into the T-shirt. So the T-shirt with the sensors has a, a little electronic device in the back that plugs into the T-shirt and that powers the sensors. So that's the first uh, feature of, the, of that device and then acts as a data logger. So the, all the data is actually logged onto that little device in the back of the T-shirt. And if you have your phone, your smartphone that's connected to the device using Bluetooth, then data will be streamed to your device in real time. Otherwise, when you bring the device close to your, your phone, then it will transfer all the logged uh, data and, and push it onto our, onto our cloud platform. Hi. Um, going to a similar direction, I wonder, um, you said you're using HTTP uh, in, with that system, um, so do you use it between the mobile phone and the thingy in your back, or how do you leverage the different aspects of the REST API there? Well, we're not really uh, in a REST mode, because uh, basically what, we're, um, what we have, we have basically three calls, three API calls. We, we used to have more than three, but when, when we saw that we, had, we were keeping on adding features and that were they were adding API calls. We said, okay, we'll pull the plug on, on, on the API way and just limit ourselves to three calls. So we have one call to actually push the data. Well, we have four calls. We have one call to push the data, one to delete it, one to retrieve it, retrieve the raw data, and one to actually ask the platform to execute an Einstein script. So that's very easy to do with HTTP because, uh, you know, if, if you want to push a million, a million uh, measurements and just take a file, million measurements, push it using a simple post uh, call, that's it. So we're not addressing uh, each time series individually with a REST semantics. Th that, would, that wouldn't be uh, very performant because if you have a million measurements, they might be from the same uh, geotime series if you're actually batch uploading, but they might be from a, a million different series. And you don't want to do a, a million API calls to actually ingest that data. So we're kind of putting the REST semantics on the side and, and simply using HTTP, HTTPS, as a matter of fact, post to, to converse with, with the API. So the first call is just pushing the data. Second call is basically telling which series you want. So that's a simple JSON um, specification. And then you will retrieve a stream of the, those data. Uh, the, the stream is actually conforming to JSON, so, so if you wait long enough, you, we will close the JSON object of the JSON area, but, but, but we advise that you actually consume it on the fly, otherwise if, if you've retrieved 10 billion points, then you're gonna be, fa you're, you're gonna be facing the same problem that we had with the memory, memory consumption. And then the, the, the Einstein submit call of the API is simply taking the Einstein script as the body of a post request 
and pushing it onto the platform. And then you will get a JSON object. Einstein is actually a stack-based language, so you will get a JSON object which is an image of the stack after your script is executed on the platform. And the, 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 the question I asked about protocol was more between the sensors, and it was just for the ingestion of the data. But what we find is that usually all those protocols, be it MQTT or co-op, they usually lack authentication um, uh, features. So you usually have to accept those protocols in an environment that's trusted on your side, and then from that trusted environment, talk to an external API using more standard stuff like HTTP. And since for the, for the smart fabric, was actually, we're actually using the smartphone as a hub, we can, you know, it's very easy to talk HTTP from a smartphone app, so that's what guided our, our choice. Uh, hello, uh, my question is how costly are the current uh, prototypes of the, for example, t-shirts? Well, the t-shirts, they will be available in, in July 2014, so the, the exact price will be set at that time, but basically they're close to the price of a high-end t-shirt from one of the top brands like Nike, Adidas, or so they're between 100 and 200 euros. And the second question, uh, what is the value added for the, uh, of the sensors? Uh, because I've seen the photos of the iPhone or of the phone. So because the phone has already the sensors, so what did you see uh, the, the, um, the other sensors we could add to the phones that could bring some value added? Well, the sensor in the T-shirt is actually a complete ECG, so it's electrocardiogram. It's not just measuring the number of beats. So that's the first thing. And then the, the validation pipeline for the sensor has lots of sensors that actually need to be very close to your body. If you're measuring the hydration of your body, then it has to be completely stuck onto your body. And then the next thing that drove the, the idea of putting sensors into the fabric is one, it's actually a dual reason. The first one is that we're talking about fabric and not clothes. So there are fabrics everywhere. And then the, the, the carpet is fabric, the curtains are fabric, there are fabric under the roads to measure things. So, so there's value in actually having the ability to embed sensors into the fabric for other things that's, than for clothes. And then for clothes, the, um, the driving point was that when you go out of your house, you have three things. You usually have your phone, your keys, and you get dressed. And of those three things, I can guarantee you there's one thing you're not going to forget to do. And that's getting dressed. I've got one more question on okay. personal data. Because actually yep. it's personal healthcare data. Do you associate the wearer's name and so on with the t-shirt? So the what? The wearer's name with the t-shirt? Yep. Yeah, well, it, it is because they're actually consent. We're not measuring that data without them knowing it. When when you buy the the T-shirt, you consent to that data collection. Otherwise, it's useless. I mean, the same thing when you actually buy a cardio uh, watch or something like that. I mean, you can buy the watch and leave it on your shelf, and then your data won't be collected. But that's probably not the reason why you bought the thing in the first place. So, we're collecting data on behalf of the owner of the device. And that's something I said when I, I talked about sharing the data, is that we think that the citizen data platform is an ethical platform in the way that we don't own that data. You own it. It's your data. And we're not doing anything with that data that you, you haven't asked us to do with it. Yeah, okay, but uh, for example, in Europe, it's a uh, little complicated to uh, host healthcare personal data. It's, it's, it's not only encryption or I know, I know. It's, it's not considered healthcare in the sense of medical healthcare data. The, and, and we have to work with the authorities about that, and, and I think the, the, the law has to take into account those new uses of data because it's something that's completely different from a physician actually measuring your heart rate and, and storing it in your medical record, right? So 
the way we see that right now is that there is a, an explicit consent when you buy the t-shirt. The so you are the one collecting the data. We are not the one collecting the data. And one of the reasons, um, I think one of the, the clues that it's, it's very true in our setup is that the, the company actually selling the t-shirt is different from the company actually storing the data. It, it's two different companies. So it's not one company selling the device, collecting the data, doing whatever they want with the data, and maybe providing you some value through some uh, a UI actually accessing that data. It's really just a storage place for that data with you owning and controlling what happens to that data. So, but, but I agree with you, there, is, there are still some issues we need to work with. Thank you. Okay, one last question. No, we are done? Okay, thank you for your question. Thank you, Matthias. Thank you.